Certainly the sentiments of that song and others like it is one that every faithful child of God entertains and accepts and tries to follow. Where he leads, I will follow. But how do you know where he leads? Well, of course, the Bible is the only way we can know how he who is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. That is the only way, I say, that we can know his will. Surely we recognize that to follow him is to do his will. And that His will is in His Word. And that that Word is the Bible in general and specifically the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Therein is His will. It is rather amazing then to hear a number of people over the last number of years in the Lord's church declare that the New Testament is not an infallible divine pattern. When the Bible is so full of material that says that it is. But you know, if you want to disbelieve one verse, what is it to disbelieve any other verse as it serves your purpose? And then, in your speaking about it, just explain it away. People have tried to do that uh, for years. Now, when we talk about a pattern, all we're talking about is instruction. That's all. And it's a strange thing to me than point, in pointing out that the Bible comes from God, which Paul does to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. He says that it is for instruction in righteousness. Well, you can't get any plainer than that. It must be then that I just don't believe it. <laughs> if I hold the view that it's not an instruction book. And for those who set aside and who teach against the New Testament being an infallible divine pattern or inspired blueprint, then they don't like it being called an instruction book either. Uh, but the Holy Spirit liked it. And I think I will go with the Holy Spirit. With the inspired penmen such as the Apostle Paul. Now, you don't have to just go to the New Testament to begin reading about a pattern. Back over in the days right after the settling of the land of Canaan, following all the wars that took place, and you can read about this in the book of Joshua, they had already seen what it was like through 40 years of wandering to disobey God and what God did to the disobedient person, the person who would not be instructed in righteousness, as God's will in God's word for that day and time set it out. They had remembered exactly what happened in the second city they tried to take. Well, they'd already taken a much larger city, Jericho. But they went up against Ai and they were beaten and they found out it because sin was in the camp. All of Israel suffered because of one man's sin. We would do well to remember that's written for your learning and mine. Because any time a member of the Lord's church commits sin, you hurt the whole church. So we need to understand that. And Israel as a whole could not accomplish what God had commanded them to do in destroying those people from off the land because of one man's sin. So when it's all about settled and you have those tribes that settled on the east side of Jordan, Reuben, Gad, half-tribe Manasseh, over in what is called the land of Gilead. The news came back that they set up an altar. Well, there's different kinds of altars, but they had a right to be suspicious because of the way the children of Israel had acted and proven themselves to be not very trustworthy for very long regarding keeping the commandments of God. So the whole of Israel went under Joshua's direction to see what have you done? Well, they found out when they got there that it was not an altar at all to offer incense on. And the people say this, or to offer sacrifices on. It was an altar to remind them that they were as much children of Israel and a servant of God under the law of Moses on that side, Jordan, 
as the others were on the west side of Jordan. Now here is here's what is said in verse 28 of Joshua 22. Therefore said we, now this would be those of Reuben and Gad and Manasseh, therefore said we that it shall be when they should so say to us, that's their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, well, they'll say to us or to our generations in time to come that we may say again, listen, behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifices. Now listen, but it is a witness between us and you. Now there was a book that came out about 20 years ago, Behold the Pattern, and now you know where the title came from. So you have it there, and as I say again, pattern simply means something to follow. We follow Jesus. How do you know how to follow Jesus? except to be instructed in righteousness, remembering the definition of righteousness. Psalm 119, verse 172, inspiration defines righteousness for us. When David says, My tongue shall speak thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. And the Bible is revealed from heaven to man to instruct us in righteousness, and is therefore profitable for doctrine for reproof. For correction. And so it is a pattern. And we follow the pattern. Patterns bring to mind things. They cause us to remember things. And thereby they are instructing us. And leading us. And guiding us. It was Peter who said in his second epistle. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in which both I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Thus, he writes a letter that has nothing new in it, but it's designed to cause them to remember what they'd already been taught and how we need that many times. But I don't understand this idea about being so against a pattern except that if you're going to get people away from God, you have to get them away from His Word. That's why the Bible's full of material all over the place. Study that Word, learn how to study it, determine to follow it because it's God's will and that's the only way you can please Him. And as Jesus said to His apostles in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Over and over again, the idea of keeping the commandments of God. And of course with the right attitude. We're not talking about some sort of flippant doing of what he said without concern for who said it. James makes it clear that the proper proof of one's trust, faith, confidence in God and in the gospel system is obedience to his will. Faith apart from works is dead, being alone. And Jesus has already made it clear that the true proof of one's love of God and all the things that are of God is rendering obedience to His will. And I ask you again, as I've asked many audiences, if you told God, I love you with all that I am and all that I have, and I'm going to show you that I do, but I'm going to show you that I do without obeying a one of your commandments, I'd like to know how you're going to do that. Or I have great faith in the gospel system to save me. Now, I'm going to show you that great confidence and trust and faith in that system of salvation found in the Bible and specifically the New Testament of Christ. But I'm not going to obey a thing you told me to do. Well, then how would you demonstrate your faith? Seeing that the only way you can demonstrate such confidence and trust in God and His Word is to do what He said in the way He said it and for the reason He said it. So we have the pattern. We have God leading us. We have God guiding us. We have God presenting His will so we can truly perform what we sang in that song a moment ago. Follow Jesus. And follow Him all the way. The question then would arise when you sing that song, how much do you really mean what you sang? And that's a good question.
that ought to be on our minds every day the rest of our life. I remember in some of the confrontations of some of the preachers who battled anteism back in the 50s, said they had a number of preachers in those days tell those that were on the firing line debating the issues that we're behind you. And one preacher said, yeah, they were behind us. We had to get a real strong uh, magnifying glass <laughs> telescope to see them, but they were behind us. We don't want to be that way. We want to be close to Jesus. And to be close to Jesus is to do what he said, the way he said it, for the reason he said it. So I said, well, I can be close to Jesus without doing that. You tell me how. I'd like to see you present a series of lessons for 45 minutes, starting tonight, going through how many nights you want to go. And so I'm going to show you how I can follow Jesus without following what his word says, I'm to believe and practice. Now you try that. They'll put you, maybe they still will, in some sort of padded cell somewhere where you just cannot hurt anybody, even yourself. Now consider with me what is also said concerning this matter of the pattern. If you go over to the Hebrews epistle, these were Jews who were Christians, but due to great temptation, were actually about to give up the whole New Testament system and go back under Judaism. Persecution was coming, and they knew it was going to get worse. They're actually thinking about doing that. So the whole book is designed to reach people who knew, who understood thoroughly. They had lived it. They had practiced it, the law of Moses. But now the gospel system, they've heard, they've believed, they've obeyed. The Lord's added them to the church, Acts 2.47, when they were baptized for the remission of their sins, Acts 2.38. And they've been continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine in Acts 2 and verse 42. But now this persecution is making them rethink things. So he writes in Hebrews 8, 5 about the importance of the New Testament pattern. The will of Christ set out the words of Christ. And he refers them back to what they were very familiar with. And that is... Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Hebrews 8, 5, I say. Now understand the Holy Spirit's caused this inspired writer to reach back over in the Old Testament and pull that out and say, Lo and behold, it'll fit you today as you serve Christ faithfully under the New Testament. Thus I know in the great mind of Almighty God when all that was happening back there hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before that he knew that was going to be quoted by the inspired writer to the Hebrews in writing part of the New Testament of the Christ to teach us about the importance of the New Testament pattern. And thus I also as a sidelight see some instruction here from God on how Christians under the authority of Christ the New Testament should employ and use properly the Old Testament. There is a system of shadows and types, but in Christ under the New Testament is the real thing. All those things pointed to the real thing. So notice when he writes, and as we've read from Hebrews 8, 5, it directs us right back to the Old Testament as a book of instruction to show us how to live under the authority of Christ in the New Testament because he's quoting Exodus chapter 25 and verse number 9. So here we look over here in Joshua and we see the word pattern, behold a pattern. And know that it's an instructional thing for the reason those people said they erected that altar in the first place. And what it was intended to convey to their children as time went by. And then we see the writer of Hebrews to cause people to stay with the truth of the gospel system. He refers back again to how close... Moses was admonished to follow the teachings of God, the word of God, the commandments of God in building the tabernacle. Later that would be the temple, of course. So we see that we have that term pattern set out. But there are two places that preachers were commanded specifically what they were to do when they preached the gospel and thus thereby teach those that heard them what they should do. Because in Titus 1 and verse 9 and in 2 Timothy 1 verse 13, the inspired apostle Paul said to both of them, hold fast the pattern of sound words. 
Sound words, the word sound means wholesome words. Well, since words are vehicles of thought, they're signs of ideas, and the Word of God is the way God gets His thoughts to us, the way His ideas travel to us, the way His will is presented to us so we can follow Jesus by keeping His will, doing His will, which means obeying His commandments. And thus, in admonishing these preachers, you don't change from preaching the Word. And Paul said that too. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So he said to these two young preachers, Hold fast the pattern or the form. Now I see a synonym. And if I know what a form is, I know what a pattern is. If I know what a pattern or form is, I know what a blueprint is. They all accomplish the same thing. They got us. They lead us. They direct us. They get us going the way that the pattern directs us. Thus, they instruct us, in this case, in righteousness, in the commandments of God, and how to live for the Lord. And that's why Hosea said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you don't know the instruction of the Lord, you can't follow Jesus. Now, our day and time... <laughs> Anybody that can smile toward heaven and say Jesus is pretty much considered a Christian. So anything passes this doctrine. And the idea is out there that as long as you acknowledge the Father and Christ as the Savior and you're lost by sin and you can't save yourself and you think of Christ as your Savior and you ask Him some form or fashion to come into your life, that's all that's needful. Everything else is periphery. If you've done that, heaven's going to be your home. Well, I'd believe that if it was taught in the Bible. But the people that say that, usually the people know very little anything else about what the Bible says accurately and correctly. If the Bible was something that was going to be taken as God intended it, just routine and customarily by people, why do you have so much in the Bible telling people, even those that believe it and know it's God's Word, how much they need to be studying it and not to neglect it? But the easy way is to say, well, the devil's against me. I'm lost. It's my fault. I can't say myself, God loves me. He gave Christ. He's my Savior. I accept him. Now let's go to the pool hall. And there's a doctrine out there right now in the emerging church idea that says we really shouldn't be in here this morning. We should find us some sports bar and go sit down with those people since they need Jesus and discuss Jesus and have a good Bible study over a good cold glass of beer. It's amazing to me what people will do to justify their sins. Because you see, if you can feel good in your sins, that God just overlooks it, then what is there that you have to be concerned about? But the Bible doesn't teach you such things as that. God has always demanded that His pattern or blueprint be followed in exactness. Take Hebrews 11, that great chapter on faith and what it is to be saved by faith and to serve God by faith. And you'll see that every time the Word of God came, faith by the Word of God was formed in the individual and the faith saved them when they did what God told them to do, not before. And thus, you go back to the days of Abel. They were instructed in God's will for that time. And Abel obeyed it, thus by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Now question, did he abide by the pattern of his day? Certainly he did. You come down to later in the book of Genesis to Noah and his family and the building of the ark that would save them from the flood. When you read that in Genesis 6, you'll see, and 7, that God specified in words on their level of understanding the dimensions, the arrangement of the material of the ark, and so on. He instructed them. He gave them the divine blueprint. Noah was approved of God, but when was he approved of God? Listen, Genesis 6, 22. Moses records... Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And go over to Hebrews 11 in the New Testament and see Noah selected as one who by faith he moved with fear 
and built an ark to the saving of his house. Well, you mean Noah had something to do with his salvation? Well, what did you read in your Bible? There's the problem. It says it in the Word of God. People say, yes, that's the Word of God. And then they'll read it and say, but then you don't believe it. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Noah's faith in the way God chose to save him and the fact that there would be even a flood to come, as God described, came through the Word of God and his faith was alive. It was living. It was active. That means an obedient faith. And he could have received that blueprint for the ark and all the instructions from God about it and said, that's right. And if he had never gone about building it, he would have drowned in the flood like everybody else. He understood that he was, to use the words that God said to Moses many, many years later, to make all things according to the pattern. God's divine pattern is set out in the New Testament, even prophesied of in the Old, for the church, the body of Christ, the family of God, the temple of the Lord. Jesus, you'll remember in Matthew 16, or rather John 14, 26 verse, had said to the apostles, but the Comforter, uh, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name by my authority. Now what's he going to do when it comes to your apostles in view of what I've called you to do as apostles? He shall teach you all things. Listen, folks. He did or he didn't. And if he didn't, we don't have the Word of God. He shall teach you all things. But not only that, he'll bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. John 14, 26, I say. Now that was the work of the Holy Spirit primarily in the New Testament to give us the truth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it would go with the apostles. That is, through them originally the New Testament was given. That's why the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They knew it was the will of Christ. Vouchsafed to them by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had promised, you'll remember now, Matthew 16, 18, to build his church. And in this passage, that is the one from John 14, in that passage, he assures us that the Holy Spirit would deliver the divine pattern. You know, if you believe the Old Testament, that it was that which uh, spoke in types and shadows pointing to the New Testament and New Testament religion, uh, then they were familiar with what the New Testament was doing and its instruction and it being called a pattern. And again, he promised to the apostles in John chapter 16 and verse 31, that is, Jesus did, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, look at the emphasis on the work of the spirit, the spirit of what? The spirit of truth. That was his fundamental work. Revealing the mind of God in words or man's level of understanding pertaining to man's salvation needs. So he revealed them. Notice, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you, that's the apostles, into all truth. Notice he's not going to be speaking of his own will. It says plainly, as Jesus was telling them this, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he shall show you things to come. John 16, 13. On that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ there in Jerusalem, when we have the account by the inspired Luke of the full preaching of the gospel for the first time, we find the apostles are said to have spoken as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts 2, 4. They're speaking the mind of Christ. Concerning the church and salvation. The Spirit safeguarded the divine pattern and presented it incorruptible. And if we will simply abide in the last will and testament of Christ, then we will be able to do what we sing in that song and follow Jesus and follow Him all the way. In speaking of the revelation of the gospel, the Apostle Paul asserted 
But God hath revealed them, that is, these things you couldn't know if God didn't reveal them. As we studied this earlier a few weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 2. But God hath revealed them unto us. How did he do that? By his Spirit. Well, why would it be the Spirit who would reveal these things unto us? Because the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. How can he do that? Well, folks, because he is God. Then he'll turn around and say, you understand that because nobody can know anything about you that's in your mind except you reveal it. Then if you know that about you, then it's logical. God would be the only one to reveal himself. And it's the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, that did the revealing. Therefore, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Theophanoustos, compound word. God breathed. Out from the very depths of the mind of God came the will of God for the salvation of man. And he put it on our level. Gave us a divine pattern or inspired blueprint and made it instruction for us in righteousness. Then he wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, which things also we speak. What things they speak? The things revealed. What was revealed? Word of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth. It wasn't left up to us to choose the words. But which the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 1 Corinthians again 2, 10 and 13. And the American Standard says of this last part where the King James has comparing spiritual things with spiritual. It says combining spiritual things with spiritual words. Thus God in this great inspiration by the Holy Spirit revealing the mind of God concerning the salvation of man in words that man can read and understand and be instructed thereby in righteousness. In those words, we are reading the ideas of the will of God. God was able, as I say, to reach into a man's vocabulary like Paul or one less educated like Peter and John, and use the vocabulary they have and cause them to choose the very words he wanted them to use. And yet, he would only cause them to use the word they knew to use. It's an amazing thing, inspiration. But the Bible is clear. The words in the New Testament are the words of Christ. Isn't it interesting? It's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, Ephesians six seventeen. But it's the New Testament of Jesus Christ. The Spirit revealed the will of Christ. If you want to know what Christ thinks about anything concerning us and mankind and salvation, go to His Word. Now, Paul has given this sober warning concerning following closely the divine pattern. He says... For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, he says to the church. Ye are God's building, he says to the body of Christ. Now notice, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon, but... Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 11. Now, now consider these words. Ye are, speaking to the church, ye are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple of the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit, Ephesians 2, 19-22. The pattern is here. And we must follow it if heaven's to be our home, which means we must follow it in order to become a Christian, which means we must follow it in how one becomes a Christian, which means we must follow it to determine at what point one becomes a Christian. And then having become Christians, to follow it to know how to be faithful. 
that we can someday hear our Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. So as we sang a while ago, we're following Jesus. You can't do that if you don't know the Bible. You just can't do it. That's why we're admonished by Paul as he wrote to Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. God has then a pattern for sound doctrine, for wholesome teaching. He wrote to Timothy, I say, hold the pattern of sound words, pattern of sound words, which thou hast heard from me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. Notice the emphasis he gave in reading this. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. So he wrote to Titus in Titus 2, verses 7 through 8. Now, sound speech or wholesome speech is necessary on your part and mine to fulfill the pattern. Again, Paul says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, wholesome teaching, Titus 2.1. Paul further charged that an elder must be adept in holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, wholesome teaching, both to exhort and convince the gainsayers, Titus 1.9. Notice how zealously Paul guarded the pattern of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When he had taught the truth or the gospel or the word of Christ to the people of Galatia and various churches came into existence through those people having heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel and being baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Notice what he said. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that call you into the grace or the favor of God Unto another gospel. Now in the Greek language it means unto a gospel of a different kind from what I preach to you. But you see there really is no another gospel in the sense of one that will save you. But somebody came preaching right after he got there and the church was established not long thereafter preaching a gospel of a different kind. So he says another gospel. And he says it then which is not another. But there be some that trouble you. Anybody preaching a perverted gospel by their conduct or however else you can instruct people anybody teaching that are they're troubling you folks and they would pervert the gospel of Christ he says but then notice but though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed Galatians 1 6 through 8 now don't you think that says the Lord takes a dim view on people changing his gospel at all the word accursed is translated anathema. It means literally the false teacher ought to be cut off. You know, these Judaizing teachers are saying, yeah, Jesus, Son of God, we've obeyed the gospel. They were Jews. That's what they had done. Now, you Gentiles, you can be saved by Jesus through the gospel too, but you've got to be circumcised and keep the law. And Paul says, if anything ought to be cut off, it ought to be the false teacher. Now, to be cut off from God means you're lost. Paul says you're accursed. Anybody that comes teaching something contrary to the truth or practicing something contrary to the truth or both, the Holy Spirit in the will of Christ by an apostle said you ought to be cut off. You ought to be cursed. And that comes from the pen of he who wrote the great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Now why was Paul so firm about this? Here's exactly why. He tells us in verses 11 and 12 of that first chapter, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul, where did you get all that we read here that you wrote about the gospel, all that? Where did you get it? I didn't learn it from anybody, as far as humans are concerned. I got it by Christ revealing it to me. Paul was set in defense of that pure pattern of sound doctrine. And so he tells the churches in Philippi, or the church in Philippi, Philippians 1, 17. His blueprint had to be faithfully followed without 
addition, subtraction, or alteration in any way whatsoever. And that's going to be characteristic of everybody that's a real Christian as the Bible defines Christian and uses that term. So that raises the question, what should be our disposition of mind, our attitude, our view toward all who refuse the pattern? Well, John tells us. We don't have to say, well, I don't know what to do about this. It's already there. In 2 John 9 verse, uh, through verse 11, Whosoever transgresseth, American standard says, goeth onward, and abideth not in the doctrine, that's the teaching of Christ, hath not God. Now, there's only one problem you're going to have with that, and it won't be lack of understanding it. It's going to be accepting it for what it says. That's what the Holy Spirit by John, the apostle of love, said. He that transgresseth, and sin is the transgression of the law, John says in 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Now watch. He that abideth in the doctrine, what about that person? He hath both the Father and the Son. Now, how should you treat somebody that comes along teaching another doctrine contrary to the one that is the New Testament doctrine? Well, you don't welcome him into your house, and you don't bid him Godspeed. And there's a reason for that. If you bid him Godspeed, God, you are a partaker of his evil deeds. Now, how does God view the person who doesn't necessarily teach the doctrine, who doesn't even believe the doctrine, but he lends aid and comfort to the enemy? God says, I look at you like I look at him. That's the reason we have to be very cautious as the church as to who we support. Because if you support a false teacher, how does God look at you, a supporter of a false teacher, though you don't even believe what he teaches? Now, he puts you on the same level. Now, if these words do not teach that, will you tell me what words he would have to write in order to teach it? Not only are we to follow the pattern of sound words which God has given, but we're also to withdraw from all those who don't hold that pattern. Period. No if, ands, or buts about it. You can start your arguments and go to court and write a commentary on it, but when you get through, it'll still read just like it reads now, and it will read that way on the Day of Judgment, and it will mean that same thing on the Day of Judgment. If we condone their actions, we then become partakers of their evil deeds and opposing the pattern from God, the divine pattern, the gospel pattern. And we're not following Jesus as we sang a while ago. So those would be simply hypocritical words, wouldn't they? Ignoring or outright rejecting this divine pattern that God has given to the world and as Christians concerning how to live the Christian life in the church. Ignoring, if you please, His gospel, God's power to save us in the words of the New Testament, Romans 1.16. Ignoring His organization is set out in the New Testament for the Lord's church. Ignoring the teaching of the Bible concerning Christian living on the part of each one who is a member of the church. Ignoring what it teaches on his worship. Any one or all of those has given rise to many pernicious and devious innovations. Our desire is to follow closely the instruction of our Lord. Folks, I, I believe this a long time ago. The Lord knows how to get David Brown to heaven. Nobody else does. Unless they teach the Lord's will, but then they're not teaching me how they think I get to heaven. They're teaching me what the Lord said about get to heaven. So I'm right back to where I started. The Lord's only one who knows how to get David Brown to heaven. And if we'll learn that, then we'll know that there's a pattern, a divine pattern, a divine blueprint, divine instruction concerning a man as to how to live a faithful life in Christ as a man. He marries, it teaches him how to be a husband. He has children, it teaches him what a father ought to be. As to a woman, the same thing. As a woman, instruction is there. As a wife, instruction is there. As a mother, instruction is there. When it comes to the children, the divine instruction, the divine pattern teaches concerning a boy and how to be a boy in a family and a son and a brother. Same is true of a girl in a family. The same is true as a daughter and as a sister. It goes right on and covers how to be a friend and even how to be an enemy and how to deal with your enemies. And it certainly instructs us on how to be as we ought to be toward one another as brothers and sisters in the great family of God, the church. It even tells me how to be a good citizen. Now, what that means is, is that everything that we are to be and to do 
in order to save our souls eternally in heaven someday. And in this life, and certainly in the life to come, the glorified Jehovah God Almighty is set out in the New Testament pattern. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I've already quoted it. We'll quote it again in the same of 2 Timothy 2 in verse 15. That's why that Paul says, whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Yes, we must follow Jesus. There is no other Savior. He declared that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. He also said earlier in that book, If you continue in my words, now think of what we studied today, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. No wonder then he prayed in John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them. That is, set them apart from the ways of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Father, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And so, if you would become a Christian, you must receive the words of Christ concerning how you do that. And the Bible's clear, you must believe that Christ is the Son of God, John 8, in verse 24, and that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Having believed in Him correctly, you must then obey the commandment to repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. And then to confess your faith in Christ that He is the Son of God, Romans 10, and verse 10. Now you're qualified before God to finish your obedience to become a Christian by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2, 38. Matthew 28, 18, and 19. Acts 22, 16. 1 Peter 3, 21. Galatians 3, 26, and 27. And on and on. The Bible's clear. The will of Christ presented. The pattern is there. You cannot do less than that and become a Christian. And it doesn't require more than that. You must do what the pattern says in the words of the New Testament of Christ. As a child of God, you must be faithful. If you're not, that's because you've sinned. And you need to repent of your sins, come confessing those sins, and let us pray with you and for you in God's second law of pardon that you might be forgiven of those sins and once again be following the divine pattern. So I conclude by simply saying, Behold the pattern. Come to Jesus while we stand and sing.